So we're still on Christmas. Everybody say, it's still Christmas. And if it's Christmas, where are we in the Bible? Luke chapter 2, that's right. Stand with me, turn to Luke chapter 2, the classic Christmas story, starting at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news. Everybody say good news. That will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And read this next part with me. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Tell your neighbor, I thought Christmas was over. And then you may be seated. Maybe you thought Christmas was over. Why are we still on Christmas? Well, for a few reasons. When, when I asked the worship team this morning why Christmas wasn't over, Lauren said, because you're doing a sermon series and you still have one more message you wanted to preach. I said, that's a good answer, but that wasn't it. Maybe it was because we made the mistake of raising our kids so well that they all serve in churches and can't get away on Christmas. And so we don't get to see them till after Christmas. So they were all, we had Christmas Eve this year fell for us on the 30th and Christmas day was December 31st at my house. So just yesterday we had all the crew there and it was wonderful. It's still Christmas in my living room. There's still lights up on the outside of the house and maybe, maybe you're weary of it. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you're ready for Christmas to be over. Julian said that in his neighborhood, people were putting their trees out on Christmas Day out on the curb. I'm, I'm like, somebody was just ready to be done with it. After all, retail Christmas began months ago, right? When, did, when does retail Christmas begin? Yeah, years ago, my pastor said, when you go to the store and see trees and lights and ornaments and wreaths on the shelves, you know that Halloween is almost here. And yet Paula told me that she saw Christmas de decor go up in the store in July. So, so why, why prolong it? Well, maybe give you a little extra time to take your lights down. Maybe, maybe like me, you, you don't want to hurry into the post-holiday diet. When the kids were, you know, we had some scheduled meals. And then at a certain point yesterday, Ellen's like, is anybody starting to get hungry? And I'm like, hungry? I haven't been hungry since before Thanksgiving. I have, I have alternated between uncomfortably full and maybe I could eat something. I, have, I haven't been hungry since like mid-November. So, so maybe there's, maybe it's time to you know, keep it Christmas so that you can go get those things that, that were on the list that your rotten kids didn't buy for you this year. I don't know, but there's a better reason. And I'll tell you about it. You know, the song, the 12 days of Christmas, kind of a weird song. I, I don't know about you, a partridge in a pear tree is not something I really want to get as a, as a gift. But it turns out it's not just a song. Christmas is, of course, a Christian holiday created by the church. Side note, a lot of people like to say that Christmas has its roots in pagan tradition. That is actually a recent narrative that's not at all true. The Christian celebration of Christmas predates all of those things. It's, it's only in the last few years that people are like, oh, we got this from the pagans. No, we didn't. We didn't. The, the, pagan, the pagans have not been an organized religion for the last 2,000 years. They, 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 just, they, they just haven't. Okay, this has been driven by the church since the, the beginning. The date of Christmas was fixed. Whether it's right or wrong, it was fixed by the church based on some church traditions. It was not stolen by the pagans. So don't worry about that. Pay no attention to the trolls. But the Christian tradition of Christmas has historically been more than just one day. December 25th, or the evening before, is considered the first day of Christmas. So on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. So give that on Christmas Eve and you're with the song. But understand, you have 12 more days. And December 5th is the 12th day. But for many Christians, Christmas really ends 
on December 6th. Anybody know what, how, uh, January 6th. Anybody know what holiday January 6th is? Good. Feast of the Magi. Ellen said Epiphany. Yes. A lot of people call it Epiphany or Three Kings Day. In the Latin American world, Three Kings Day is, is a big deal. And, and most of the Latin American, Latin, you know, the South America, Central America, they celebrate Three Kings Day on the 6th, and it's a big deal. And what does that celebrate? It celebrates the gospel being revealed to the Gentiles. That's where we get the word epiphany, revealed to the Gentiles, as is signified by the visits of the Magi. The Magi coming is, in the church tradition, the, the sign of the gospel being revealed to the Gentiles. And that lines up with the song that I want to talk about today. For our Christmas series, we've been looking at some of the songs of Christmas, and we've been examining the powerful messages from Scripture that we find in them. And so because we are really looking for scriptural messages in Christmas songs, Don Lunsford suggested to me this morning that perhaps Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer would be the next message in our series. But it is not. It is not. We started with What Child Is This? Then we went to Silent Night on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. We did Joy to the World. And this morning, Go Tell It on the Mountain. So Go Tell It on the Mountain. I've been giving you a little background on where we got these Christmas songs. This one is a little bit mysterious, and I don't think we will ever really know the origin of this because it comes from African-American spirituals. It was passed down by oral tradition over the years, and those songs were rarely ever written down or recorded. But we can thank a gentleman named John Wesley Work Jr. for our knowledge of it today. He is credited as being the first collector of African-American folk songs and spirituals. And in 1907, he published this song in a book of spirituals. And he may have had a hand in writing it and arranging the song in the way that we know and love today. And the song very simply walks through these events of Luke chapter 2 that we just read. And as we'll see, it captures a part of the narrative in a way that few other songs do. Most of the songs focus on perhaps the song of the angels or the, the baby in the manger, just that Christ has come. But Go Tell It on the Mountain focuses on those last couple verses that we read aloud. And we'll see that. Let's go back to verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. That lines up with our song. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. The shepherds feared and trembled, but the angel, verse 10, said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Let's camp on this verse for a minute. He says, Don't be, don't be, don't be frightened. It's good news. It's good news. The word for good news there is the Greek word, itso. Everybody say, itso, itso. It looks on paper like angelizo, and it's where we get the term evangelism. That's where we get the term from the Greek word for good news or gospel. It combines two Greek words, the word for good and the word for angelisto. You see how angel is in the middle of that word? Angel is just another word for messenger. The angels of God are the messengers of God. So you put that together and it's a good message. It's good news. It's a special announcement. It's, it's like this breaking news, extra, extra, read all about it. We have exciting news. It's good news. You see, in this culture, you didn't have Facebook. You didn't have Instagram. You, you couldn't hire an airplane to bring a banner and roll it across the skies. So what did you do when you had good news? Well, if you were rich, you would hire some heralds. And so they couldn't tweet about it. They didn't even have a postal service. So they would hire heralds for a big announcement, and they would pay these people to go around town and say, hear ye, hear ye, we bring this news. And especially if you had a firstborn son, that is one of the things you would do to celebrate. It's big news. So what is the good news? What is this gospel, this good news? The good news is verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior 
has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The town of David is Bethlehem. A Savior has been born to you. It's the Greek word soter. It means a, a Savior, a deliverer. It's often applied to kings and rulers that would bring about a new era of freedom and joy. So today, a Savior has been born to you. Well, what kind of Savior? What kind of deliverer is this? Christ the Lord. Christos Kyrios. We talked about this. We went over this a lot in the book of James, right? Where, where James said that he was a servant of, the, of Christos Kyrios, of Christ the Lord. That Jesus was Savior, which is Christ, Messiah, and he was Lord. He is the King. So just to make things clear, this, this is the Messiah, the Lord, the coming King. This is what you've been waiting for. This is what you have been praying for. This is what you've been longing for. For centuries, they've been praying. They've said, Lord, please send us another Savior. Send us another Messiah, like, like Moses, who was a deliverer of the people from their bondage in Egypt. King like David. Until now, all of the prophets were looking forward. One day he will come. The Messiah will come. God will send a deliverer. He will save his people. It's a new king, a new ruler, the Messiah. Hold on. Don't lose heart. He's coming. And now here in Luke chapter 2, at last, the angels announce the good news. He's here. He's here. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, Christ the Lord. Finally, it's a boy. God the Father is passing out cigars in heaven. Send out the heralds. We have great news. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. The angels, hark the herald angels. You always wonder why that we say hark the herald angels. Like, are the angels named herald? No. They're heralds. They are bringing the good news. And the shepherds are told, Hey, good news, the Savior's here, and they're told where to find him in Bethlehem, and they're told how they will know. It's going to be a baby wrapped in claws, and instead of a crib, he's going to be laying in a feeding trough. So that's unique. Most parents didn't put their baby in a feeding trough, but that's where you will find the baby. So the heralds do their thing. He's here. And then what do the shepherds do? Do the shepherds sit around and talk about it? Do they, do they say, oh, this was great. Let's hold a conference and talk about angelic messengers. No, they go to find the Savior. Verse 15, when the angels left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened that the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And then what, they, what did they do? Well, they heard the message. They responded to the message. And then they found out, hey, it's true. It's all true. It's good news. So what was their next step? And this is the focus today. Verse 17, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The next step, tell others. And that's what inspires this song. That's what this song is all about. Go tell it on the mountain. Jesus is, is here, just as they had been told. They found the baby lying in a manger, and the song says what they found. Down in a lonely manger, our humble Christ was born, and God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas more. And they found out it's true, and their response, that's the chorus. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. You heard the good news. You responded to it. You found out it's true. Now go tell someone. So here's a few thoughts inspired by go tell it on the mountain. Number one, the shepherds heard the good news. Someone had to tell the shepherds. We all know Romans 10, 9. Anybody know Romans 10? Poor Taylor, she knows it. She's heard me use it many times. I, I use it when I preach the gospel at funerals. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We know verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then verse 14, right after those verses, Paul reminds us, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him 
unless someone tells them. In recent years, it's been very popular to quote Francis of Assisi with this quote, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. How many of you have heard that before? You heard that? A few, few of you heard that? Okay, well, there's two problems with that quote. Number one, Francis never said it. He didn't. He's very well documented. He's got a lot of quotes, a lot of writings, and there's a lot of people who've looked into this, and he never said that. The other problem with it is that the Bible makes it clear that words are pretty necessary. Words are pretty necessary. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Well, it's necessary. It's always necessary. Yes, it's true. Your actions should not contradict your message, right? Use words and your actions should not contradict that. And sometimes that's our problem. That's our problem with the gospel. Sometimes you find people who are trying to browbeat people into becoming Christians and the way they've conducted themselves makes you want nothing to do with them. That's a problem. But the Bible is clear that in order to respond to the gospel, people need to hear the gospel. Well, how do they hear? Well, on this rare occasion, God himself stepped in and sent messengers to share the gospel, the good news. And that's how the shepherds heard the good news. They heard the good news. And then what did they do? Number two, the shepherds responded to the good news. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. There are many people who've heard the good news, but for whatever reason, they have never responded. Giving mental assent to the gospel is not enough. What does that mean? Mental assent is, I agree, that's great, that sounds good. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Bible makes it clear we need to actually respond to the gospel. I've met a lot of people that believe there's a heaven. They believe there's a heaven, but they, they just kind of expect to go there without ever making a decision to follow Jesus. And James warns us in chapter 2, verse 19, he says, You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. It's not enough to just say, yes, I, I believe that. You have to follow your belief with action or it's useless. Think of it. I was trying to think of how to illustrate that. I thought, well, if somebody gave me a really great stock tip and I was like, yeah, that's a great stock tip. And then in the weeks and months later, I saw that stock increase in value and go through the roof. I was like, wow, that was true. But if I never invested anything in that stock, it does me no good. Well, the gospel, it's a hard thing to illustrate because the gospel is infinitely more important than a stock tip. The shepherds heard the good news, but what's more important is they responded to it. They went to go find Christ. And then number three, the shepherds shared the good news. Verse 17, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. It's interesting because technically the shepherds became angels. The word angel is messenger, right? The, the, the messengers, the proclaimers of God's word, and the shepherds, after going and responding to the good news, became angels in that they went out as heralds of God's good news. You know, sometimes God steps in himself. Sometimes we see that, right? We see the angels talking to the shepherds. Or earlier in the Christmas story, Zachariah and Elizabeth get a message from an angel. And Mary gets her own angelic messenger. And Joseph gets his own angelic messenger. Paul, on the road to Damascus, as Julian was referencing earlier, Paul was a, a, a person zealously persecuting the church. And God himself knocks Paul off his high horse and says, you're going the wrong way, buddy. You're kicking. This is not. You want to be zealous for God? You are just going the complete wrong way. And, and God's like, you know what? I just had to step in and say, no, you're not going to go around persecuting these followers of the way. Instead, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Oh, that's what a Pharisee wanted to hear. And how else, how else would Paul have had that turn except that God himself intervened? But that's not what we usually see. Most of the time, the task of sharing the good news is left to us. Most of the time. Wouldn't it be nice if God did all the work? But he's entrusted us with his message. The Great Commission. Last thing he says, hey, before I go, I, I want to give you your marching orders. Go in all the world. Make disciples. Tell everyone about this. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
keep working at this until I come back. This is your job. It's your mission now. The mission of Jesus was to seek and to save the lost. And he passed his mission to his disciples, us, and said, okay, here's your mission. Take this now to the ends of the earth. Jesus, even during his ministry, had his disciples go out and send the message. Paul talks about equipping saints for the work of the ministry. Oh, well, preaching the gospel, that's the job of pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets. It's a job for everyone. I'm thankful that God gave us those gifts, but he gave us those gifts to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, saint. You know, sometimes after I find myself, after I am in a church for a while and I get to know people very, very closely and I count them among my friends, that every once in a while it kind of strikes me as odd or formal when they keep calling me pastor. Like pastor is my first name. Like I'm not offended by it. It is my title. But eventually I get to the point where like, I'm like, they call me pastor and I'll be like, yes, saint, pastor, yes, deacon. Why are you doing that? Well, we're going by titles. We're on a first name basis with Jesus, but you're, you know, you call me pastor or I don't feel respected. I understand. I, I don't mind. You call me pastor all day if you want. But every once in a while, I might get a little saucy and call you saint. Because that's what you are. You're the saints. And he gave the pastors to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? Is bringing the gospel to the world. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, we have that famous verse where Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We've been given that job. It's an awesome responsibility. Like the angels, at some point, we heard it. We heard the gospel message. Where did we hear it? Maybe you heard it from your parents. Maybe you heard it from teachers. Maybe a friend at work shared the gospel message. Maybe, maybe a, a TV show. I remember when I was doing baptism testimonies and I was, a young boy was getting baptized and and I'm no respecter of age when it comes to baptism. I just don't, I don't want to baptize you unless you understand what's going on. And so I asked the young boy, I said, how did, you know, what does Jesus mean to you? Did, when, how did you make a decision to come to Jesus? And he was just like, well, the, the preacher on the TV told us about Jesus and that we needed to ask him to forgive our sins and be our Lord. And so I put my hand on the TV and I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive my sins and be my Lord. And I'm like, all right, this kid's got it. He's got a clearer testimony than a lot of adults I've talked to. We heard the gospel. And then at some point we responded to it. When did you respond to the gospel? Julian was talking about how at age 14, he had that revelation. He was going through the motions, but at age 14, he had this realization that what, you know what? I haven't actually responded to this thing. I've been doing the Christian things. I've been going to church. I've been saying the right things. I've been trying to be a good person. But at some point, he had to make a decision to respond to the gospel. I was, I was a wee lad. I was three and a half years old. And in a Sunday school class at the Reformed Church, Dutch Reformed Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, my Sunday school teacher, Elaine Wing, asked us if we want to ask Jesus into our hearts. It was the Sunday before Valentine's Day. And I came, I, I remember, I remember it. I remember the green classroom and the the tables that are lower because we're children with the tiny chairs. And I remember bowing my head at that table and asking Jesus into my heart. And you say, well, three and a half, can that be a sincere commitment? Well, yeah, because by three and a half, I was a rotten kid. I needed saving. I, I, I mean, I remember, I remember at a very young age being aware of my sin. I mean, I was supposed to be eating Cheerios and I was getting into the Fruit Loops and got into Lucky Charms and it was all downhill from there. No. In all honesty, my first recollection of sin, I remember I was supposed to be sleeping for a nap. I was supposed to be taking a nap in my room, and instead I was sitting on the floor and I was stuffing crayons into a wiffle ball. I know that sounds like a horrible sin, right? But it's actually my first recollection of that naughty feeling that I knew the right thing to do, and I knew I was doing the wrong thing. And I had that, my conscience pricked me at that young age, and I knew I was doing wrong. So yeah. I got saved at three and a half. And I'm so glad because I've never committed a sin since that day. No, that's the sad thing. Most of the sin I've committed in my life is since knowing Jesus. I, I wish that initial, initial time of 
coming to the Lord just instantly sanctified me, and, and I never had the temptation to sin again. But I, I knew the gospel from my parents, but it was Elaine Wing who challenged me, are you going to respond to the gospel? And I made the decision in that classroom. And we all have to make that decision at some point. I remember being traveling for our college and being a camp counselor at a camp in Michigan. And the district youth director's son was in my cabin. And he came up to me one night and he said, he said, you know what? I said, he said, I don't ever remember giving my heart to Jesus. He's like, I'm a pastor's kid. I've done Bible quiz. I know scripture. I've been, I, I pray. I sing the worship songs, but I don't ever remember that moment. And so he said, tonight, if, if at the end of the service, if I responded to the altar call, he said, would you pray with me? Because I want to have that moment. And I was like, I said, dude, I'd be so honored. I'd be so honored to do that and to have that moment with you. So you can look back and say, that's the moment that I respond. He knew the gospel, but he wanted to make sure he had that. He knew that he had responded to the message. And I think most everybody here, you've heard the message. I think most everybody here, you've responded to the message. If you didn't, you had a chance to do it before communion. I'll give you another chance here at the end of my message. But it's that next step that this song talks about, which is that now it's our job to share it. It's our job to share it. And so as I was wrapping up this Christmas series, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do one more song on New Year's Day. What should I do? What would be the, the, the best thing, the perfect message to kick off 2023? And I mean, it's, we're off to a strong start. I actually got the date right in the bulletin. It's usually mid-January before I switch that year. Okay, I, I, I got it right already. We're off to a great start, but I thought, what would be a good start? And I thought the good start would be to focus on where are we at? We've heard the gospel. We've responded to the gospel. Now it's our job to share it, to share the gospel, to share the good news. And the good news is that we have the best news. The God of the universe has already made the way for people to be reconciled to him. This world is messed up. There's a better world to come. And through Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, we have a God that will walk with us through this journey, through this messed up world. Because those of you who have been saved for a while have found that following Jesus doesn't mean all your problems go away, right? We still have troubles, but until we until we meet him face to face and or you know, either at the second coming or if he tarries the day we leave this old life behind, one of these days, but until that day we get to walk through this world with God with us, Emmanuel, and there's a better world to come. We have the best news. You know that End of that Christmas story, verse 18, all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I think sometimes one of the reasons we're hesitant to share our faith is that we forget that it's really good news. We're not imposing our opinions. It's not like I'm trying to persuade you to vote for my political candidate. I'm telling you that the Savior has already accomplished everything that needs to be, everything that needs, let me say this again. The Savior has already accomplished everything that needs to happen for you to be reconciled to God. But you must respond. You must respond. And for people to hear and respond, we need to be sharing it. Amen? I know we already gave an opportunity earlier, but I want to just remind you, if you're here, you're watching online, maybe through this message, you realize, you know what? I've heard the message. I've done a lot of the Christian things, but I've never responded. I've never had that moment where I said, you know what, today I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to make Jesus my Lord, my Savior. I am going to ask him to forgive my sins and be my Lord. And if that's you this morning, I want to give you that opportunity one more time just to pray a prayer, just to say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross, for forgiving my sins. Today I ask you to be my Savior and to be my Lord. And if you made that decision today, the Bible tells us there's two things we need to do. It's not a works-based salvation, but the Bible makes it clear that we need to respond. We need to respond. First of all, you need to tell somebody. You need to conf Jesus says, you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. You need to confess. You need to tell somebody. You, you need to find a friend that you know is a Christian. You need to contact somebody and say, today I decided to follow Jesus. And number two, you need to get baptized. What is baptism? It's telling people. It's shouting it on the mountain. 
It's saying, hey, Jesus Christ is born, and I am a follower of Jesus. So I'll encourage you, if you made that decision today, tell somebody, and then find a church, get involved, come here to Spring Creek Fellowship, and get baptized. The challenge I have for us, congregation, is this. Are we sharing the good news? Now, we do it through missions, right? We, we send people, right? How are people around the earth going to hear unless we, we send them? But just because we send them doesn't relieve our obligation to also go. To go in, whether it's in our job, in our neighborhood, in our schools. We don't get off the hook by sending missionaries and supporting the preachers. We need to go as well. And what is our call? Just to be a witness. Just to tell what we've seen. Just to tell what we've seen. And I promise you, if you will do that, there's going to be times that people won't receive it, but you're going to find, like those shepherds did, that there are people that are going to be amazed at what you have to tell them. What greater goal could we have in this new year than to share Christ with others? Amen? Stand with me. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for this army of believers. I pray, Lord, that in 2023, you would use us like never before to share your gospel, Lord. Lord, maybe you're calling some to stand on a street corner and preach, Lord, but you're calling each of us to share with our neighbors, with our friends, with our co-workers. So, Lord, equip us, enable us, empower us. Lord, use us to shine as a light in the darkness, Lord, to proclaim, to go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Lord, I pray you bless your people, Lord. You keep them safe as they drive. I pray you help us to come together again this week and devote time starting off this new year to prayer. So, Lord, we thank you. We bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy New Year. Go with God. He goes with you.